ever been to a drag race? No? Then hang on. We're going to take you for a spin and show you why drag racing, believe it or not, is America's most popular spectator sport. country to the other, at hundreds of tracks, north, south, east, west, millions of people come to watch thousands of cars try to get from one end of the quarter mile track to the other in the shortest possible time. Seemingly by making as much noise as they possibly can. That's drag racing, as it first meets the eye and the ear. Streaks of color roaring past with deafening noise and eye-smarting, nostril-pinching clouds of smoke and fumes. We're at Great Lakes Dragaway, Union Grove, Wisconsin, where the action is on a typical summer weekend. show you what it's like to gaze down the track at for miles an hour with our camera mounted on one of those spidery looking dragsters. a distance of a quarter mile in a time of less than 10 seconds. In fact, sometimes in less than seven seconds from a standing start. And for those few seconds of running, there are hours of standing still. Working in the pits, taking apart, and putting together again. Assembling and disassembling. Checking tolerances to the thousand, to the ten thousand. No glory in the pits, but without the mechanics, there'd be no cars, because these babies are put together by hand. National Dragway, a super drag strip nestled in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It's the site of one of the ten big races that determine the national championship. We're here early. The track is deserted. The stands empty. But not for long. Two drag racing fans, and there aren't any other kind, come early for the time trial. And the cars come early, too. 400 to 500 cars per event. Mostly of the stock class, meaning not too different from what you'd find on a dealer's showroom floor. And their drivers, the youngsters who make up the bulk of the entries, sacrifice lunch and girlfriend to test their gear ratios and fuel mixtures again and again. No car ever seems to arrive ready to go.
The fans come from everywhere. Paid drag racing attendance is on the verge of topping 20 million persons a year. And that's a mark few other spectator sports come close to. Two by two. And one by one. And family by family. The fans pour in, bringing their own, as you can see. It's going to be a long, hot, thirsty day. On the whole, it's a young man's sport. The average age of the spectators is just under 23 years. A recent survey showed that 40% of the crowd at the big national events were college educated. The survey also turned up 594 different occupational titles, from priests to professors, from physicians to baseball players. As the fans continue to flock in, we go skyward for a helicopter view of the scene at Bristol, one of the drag racing meccas of the world. Looks like it's going to be a full house today. The drivers pilot the cars to fame and fortune, but the unsung heroes are the men in the pits. Some of these mechanics are Vietnam veterans who worked on battle-damaged equipment, a little different from tinkering around in the garage. Drag racing attracts the serious interest of automotive engineers, Detroit included, and a whole flock of lubrication, fuel, and parts makers who find out what their products can do under the most demanding conditions. Drivers. A top pro can clear $150,000 a year in a sport that used to offer no prize money at all. Just the thrill of it. Those were the old days. And not necessarily the good old days. When you hitched your car to a truck and drove 800 miles to Michigan just for some local race on a beat-up track, and there wasn't even room at the end of the track to turn around, and you had to spin. Things are a lot different now. The top drivers arrive in style. Their cars are delivered in trailers like thoroughbred horses. Champion fuel dragster Don Prudhomme knows his car from inside out. Has to. These vehicles are worth fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a piece. They get tender, loving care and very close safety inspections. Into the staging area they come, the famous drivers and the famous cars, carrying nicknames as familiar to drag racing fans as Johnny U and OJ are to pro football fans. Names like Big Daddy Don Garlic. Don the Snake Prudhomme, and his arch rival, Tom Mongoose McEwen, and Dick Harrell, Mr. Everything, and the American Hot Rod Association Driver of the Year in 1969. Binoculars in the control tower keep a constant eye on things below. So does John Lundberg, the famous voice of drag racing as familiar a sound of the track as the roar of the engines themselves. Taking a seat in the stands, we look down on the traditional free race parade of stars in review. This is the last time today they'll creep along at this speed. The uh, automobiles aren't the only frames that catch the eye. The girls in the control tower will keep track of the cars and their times as the split seconds tick off on the chrono deck. No handheld stopwatch would be quick enough to measure these speeds, 
where a thousandth of a second can mean winning or losing. No, that car hasn't flipped its lid. You can tell a funny car by its fiberglass body that flips up over the frame like the top of a cigarette box. As the cars are lined up, last-minute adjustments are made to flame suits. The drivers don their masks, helmets, goggles, and attach their seat and chest straps. The cars are started by outside power sources. They carry no radiators, so that once started, there can be no delay in making the run. One of the most crowd-pleasing effects of the drag race is the burnout. A mixture of rosin and bleach is poured in front of the rear wheels. The car is moved into the puddle and full power applied to spin the wheels curiously. The results of this spectacular procedure assure clean, hot tires. Very often the ritual is repeated at the starting line with an actual track of fresh khaki rubber laid down to give the car a good gripping start. should be able to get from zero to 200 miles per hour in no more than seven and a half seconds. With that kind of acceleration, its automatic transmission doesn't last very long. After three runs, it needs rebuilding, as does the motor after maybe five or six runs. And sometimes, they don't even last one run. Dragsters, as a class, are something else. They have no bodies at all, just spidery frames with bicycle wheels up front and enormous tires in the rear. Set way back on the frame, supercharged engines, each generating more than 1,500 horsepower, consume up to three gallons of metromethane based fuel in a quarter mile run. That fuel, incidentally, costs about $7 a gallon. It doesn't pay to use your dragster for grocery shopping. The skies over Bristol had threatened rain all day, and it finally came. Some don't mind it a bit. Let's wait, though. Maybe it's just a shower. After an hour, out comes the sun, and the cars are uncovered for another try. There can be no racing on a wet track. For maximum traction, these tires have no tread at all. Hence their nickname, Slicks. Tow cars are pressed into service to help dry the track. Some of these paint jobs cost over care for a ride on a Cyclops. We mounted a camera securely on one of Art Arpon's fabulous green monster jet dragsters. After Art finishes packing his chutes, which he does as carefully as a skydiver, we'll give you a feel of what it's like to cruise along on the jet car. Meanwhile, let's go along with world champion stunt pilot Art Shaw whose exhibitions at national championship events like this one at Bristol are worth pausing in the races for. Art does his thing in the Super Chipmunk. Here is one of the toughest maneuvers, the notorious Lumshavak Stagger Fall.
The Keisha Brothers Odyssey Turbanique Dragster is capable of flying, too. All drag racers in competition have to wear flame-resistant clothing. But fuel dragster drivers wear asbestos aluminum suits and pure air masks to keep the nitro fumes from reaching their lungs. In 1959, Don Garlitz, the first drag racer to top 200 miles per hour in the quarter mile, suffered bad burns by not wearing a flame suit. He was out of competition for a year. The Odyssey has touched the 200 mile per hour mark more than once. Only a few years ago, a mathematician figured out it was physically impossible for a drag car to cover a quarter mile in less than seven seconds. The current record is 6.55 seconds, held by Don Garth. All you have to do is hang on. At 150 miles per hour, the wheel threatens to leap from your hands, while a force of two Gs backs into your chest like an elephant. After a few seconds of that, you're faced with up to 5 G's negative deacceleration as the chute opens. Where races are won or lost by a thousandth of a second, the start off the line is all important. There can be no red lighting, that is, no jumping the gun. The electronic starting lights take care of that. Two times are important for the drivers. Elapsed time, measured from the beginning of the quarter mile to the end, and trap time, the last 132 feet of the run, which measures speed in miles per hour. Cars of different classes, and there are about a hundred classes in which the vehicles of every imaginable kind can compete are matched through the use of delayed starts. The timer on the track can control the Christmas tree light so that one car gets the go signal before the other. The driver watches the Christmas tree lights flicker down to green and then, with a lightning reflex on the accelerator, the driver gets on it. The wheels bite. Coiled power lashes out to cover the length of the track. The sound of 1,500 horsepower amplified through 12-inch exhaust pipes is a physical blow. The mechanics, called tuners, can get help from the specialty companies whose parts they're using, like Pennzoil, Carter Carburetor Company, Wynn Oil Company, and the Hearst Corporation. The Hearst Aid Wagon comes into the pits to lend its expertise in shifting mechanisms. Even with the experts' advice, these boys work in challenging conditions, dealing with tolerances that would make a garage mechanic flinch. One thing's for sure, any young man who'd rather make something than break something gets a constructive opportunity here. Whatever he's putting together in the pit better hold up on the track. Besides being the American Hot Rod Association Driver of the Year in 1969, Dick Harrell is a top-notch mechanic who builds and services cars for other drivers. The relationship between the cars and the speed equipment industry is closer than peanut butter and jelly. And the cars proudly wear as many sponsors' decals as the luggage of a world traveler. Speed equipment sales were $500 million three years ago, now, they're over a billion. As we mentioned a bit earlier, sometimes those horses want to go in a direction all their own. Hold it. Hold it. You're out of your lane. Automatic disqualification. Drifting can be dangerous for both drivers. One holds up, seeing his competition has gone astray. Any car capable of speeds up to 200 miles per hour must have a parachute. And a car that can do better than 200 must have two.
it's time for a ride in Art Arpon's jet-powered Cyclops. This day, it reaches a speed of almost 260 miles per hour in just over six seconds. No wonder. That's an F-104 Starfighter engine with 17,500 horsepower. Hart's not required to wear fireproof coveralls. His fuel is kerosene. Our cameraman ducks in just long enough to start the camera. She rocks before she rolls. Art fires the afterburner right on the line. Pure thrust. Now let's see what the mounted camera saw. That was quick. In shooting this sequence, we used a new type of camera that slows the action down to 30 times slower than actual speed, giving you an idea of the terrific stresses placed on tires and car. Here it is, in ultra-slow motion. Look at that body flex. Normal speed. Looks like we're preparing the testifying ride of E. J. Potter. One thousand horsepower, nitro fuel guzzling, three twenty-seven Chevy powered motorcycle. Interesting note, you fans is that they are now going to conduct a procedure in the starting line known as a slick barbecue, wherein the motorcycle will be rocked up on a Man and machine versus time and themselves. The art and the science. And the nerve to cover a quarter mile just as fast as your wheels can take you. That's drag racing. A sport that may be one of the newest, but is already one of the biggest. And if you wonder where it's going, well, chances are that kid next door, who's not even old enough yet to have a driver's license, has a model car kit that he's already converted to a drag racer, complete with supercharger and other high performance items, right down to speed equipment suppliers decals. Even the toddlers have their Hot Wheels sets. There are a lot of youngsters these days who dream of becoming drag stars, which means more than souped up jalopies on a neighborhood street. Drag racing has come of age. 
in the spectrum of American sports, few match this spectacle for color and excitement. Drag racing? Well, it's anything but a drag.